Well, it seems like everybody's warm enough. I saw a few of you have moved further away from the heaters. That's a good sign. So uh, we, uh, we're glad they're working. And those of you that are cold, you can ask the people around you, and we can turn it up a little if you need to, because some of them are turned down and some are turned up. So it just depends how you feel. But good deal. Well, let's begin this morning with prayer. And then we'll dive in. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning we are worshiping in another unique setting due to the challenges of our our time on this earth. And Lord, uh, we know as time progresses that where we worship will get more and more varied and secret. Uh, certainly as your, as your second coming comes, we will be worshiping in any location that we can uh, that's safe. So Lord, we're just... We're practicing for that, I guess, this morning, and we thank you for the, the heat and the, the roof over our heads and, and for the rain, Father, to wash our, our air and settle the dust. Father, this morning we want to hear from Jesus, so we ask for your Holy Spirit to be present, to guide us and direct us, and to hear you speaking to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning to our friends on Zoom, and welcome to well, 2020 is now in November. New Year's resolution for 2021. Please, Lord, no more 2020, right? Uh, quite the year of challenges, one after the another, that uh, make you kind of want to just hunker down, bunker mentality, don't they? Uh, let's just... Stay home, bunker mentality. You can get almost anything to come to your house now. You can get food even. They'll deliver food right to your door. So it's like, well, let's hunker down. Let's, let's, let's hide away from everybody. Everyone's dangerous. They either have the Rona or the COVID, whichever nickname you give it. They either have the Rona or they could disagree with me politically and that could be dangerous. So let's just hide from everyone because everyone is dangerous. There's just one problem with that philosophy. It's not a very Christian one, is it? It's very difficult to share the everlasting gospel when you're hiding from everyone in your personal bunker that you only allow Amazon to visit. So this morning, as, as is fitting, as we're talking about our, our time of service, and what our church is going to look like, because that's really what's happening with the nominating committee. It's not just about we get a list and we start putting names in. It's about what you want your church to look like. So that's part of why these sheets are getting passed out. gives you a chance to tell us what you're passionate about, what you want to do for God, what God's asking you to do this year. So the nominating committee looks at that very seriously and decides, hey, if this isn't working... Maybe we won't do that ministry this year. Or if there's a new ministry that God is calling you to, then maybe we'll add that on. But this morning, the one thing I am going to speak out against is shelter in place. Because there's no way to serve people when we have the bunker mentality. Now, I'm not asking you to be reckless. I'm not asking you to go around kissing the cheeks of strangers. Very European of you, but let's hold off on that this year in 2020. But I am saying that God still wants his people to witness, to minister, to serve. And as things get more crazy and more tense, people need more help, don't they? The mental health of our country is a little tenuous because of all these things. We're seeing an uptick in all sorts of mental health challenges. Because when we hunker in place, it doesn't really help our mental health. So people still need service. And we're seeing this, actually, as we're going to talk, spreading to other countries. And we're going to talk about some other countries this morning as well. But if you're weary this morning, weary of all the challenges you've had to face, weary of all the sheltering in place, weary of all the things that life has thrown at you, I want to give you this 
Bible verse to keep in your mind. And I've thought a lot about this Bible verse because it's easy to get tired. And it says, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Galatians 6. It's a great verse. Galatians 6, verse 9. Galatians 6, verse 9. Bibles or phones, if you have those as well. This is actually our scripture for this morning. Galatians 6, verse 9, and it tells us, Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Do you want to give up on doing good this year? Hide at home and have Amazon on speed dial? Well, God is asking us not to give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, this is verse 10, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Do not grow weary of doing good to others, but also to each other. Have we faced challenges as a community this year? If you've needed some help, have you kept that to yourself? Or have you reached out to your church family. Please, if you need help, reach out to your church family, whether it's financial, emotional, or mental. We would love to help. The call of service. This is what Galatians 6, 9 is talking about. And Galatians, they weren't exactly dealing with a rosy, easy time either, were they? The early church. First and Second Peter talks a lot about what the early church is going through. They're being persecuted to the point of almost having to sacrifice their lives for what they believe. So challenges that face the church are not new. And the devil wants us to give up, grow weary, get tired of this earth. And boy, are we tired. But we can't give up on doing good. So then the question from this verse comes to us. What kind of service are you being called to? Sometimes we can guess what you're being called to. Sometimes we might even get it right. But really, the call to serve the Lord comes to your heart from the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? And he's asking something of you this year. He's given you unique talents. Unique things that you can do that I can't. And some of you may say, yeah, but then the nominating committee, they ask for all these mundane work a day every year, same jobs, you know, somebody's got to teach Sabbath school, somebody's got to do this, da, da, da. What, is, what good is any of that doing? Well, let me put this thought to you. In every single one of these Sabbath schools, that are taught, including the beginner Sabbath school where I was this morning with Dorothy, every single one of those Sabbath schools, those teachers are teaching non-believers. My kids aren't believers yet, are they? They're just meeting Jesus. They haven't chosen for themselves, have they? Maybe in the youth class where Amanda was this morning, they're, they're starting to think for themselves whether they want to follow Jesus or not. But every single one of those classrooms is a non-believer classroom. They may have grown up with Jesus and met Jesus along the way, but they have to choose for themselves, don't they? They must choose for themselves. Joshua 24 tells us this, Choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. They're coming to Sabbath school. They don't get a choice right now. They're in my household. They're coming to church. They're coming to Sabbath school. But someday they will choose for themselves whether they want to follow Jesus or not. That makes our children's Sabbath school feel a lot more important, doesn't it? When you're talking about the salvation of our children and how they're being trained to follow God. Not so mundane or workaday to teach Sabbath school anymore, is it? When that is part of the process of them learning to love and meet Jesus. As it was for me, and maybe as it was for you. Let me give you another example. My child is 
cooperating wonderfully for Daddy during the sermon. <laughs> Mommy's flying solo over there. Hey, you, be good. All right, let's let's use another example. Say you minister, and I don't know how necessarily you could do this during COVID, but say six feet away at the mailbox, you're talking to your neighbor. And you develop a friendship. And you begin to mentor them. Maybe even you start Bible studies with them. Here's the question. As this process continues, are you by yourself with this bunker mentality going to be able to fulfill all the Holy Spirit roles for that person that they would need? Where are you going to bring them to get more of the spiritual gifts where they can experience more of Jesus? You're going to bring them to church, aren't you? Because unless you're exceptionally talented and the Holy Spirit has given you all the spiritual gifts they list, and we're going to list quite a few here that the Bible talks about, then you're going to need to bring them to the church body where they can be loved, mentored, befriended. Aren't they? What happens here this morning isn't just about us having a good time together. We're building a community of believers that anytime somebody walks through our doors, they can be mentored and brought into the family, can't they? That they can be welcomed, that they can become an instant friend with multiple people that love Jesus and want them to love Jesus and meet Jesus too. What happens on a Sabbath morning isn't accidental. It has to be intentional on our part. To have a warm family community for anyone that any one of us brings to our church, they need to feel like that group of people wouldn't leave me alone because they're so friendly. What you do Sabbath morning matters. What you do for the church matters as a witness to both those here and to the community. Let me phrase it this way. I'm going to quote you three main passages that should drive this thought home that it's biblical. Are you listening, Ashley? Yeah, she is now for 15 seconds. All right, Ephesians 4. Attention span's pretty short. Ephesians 4. If you want to turn your Bibles there, Ephesians 4. This is how Paul says it. Ephesians 4, verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service. Not everyone is an evangelist, an apostle, a prophet, or pastor, or a teacher. But all of those roles are together to build the body of Christ together. Continuing in verse 12, so that the body of Christ may be built up. How do you have a body of Christ that's built up when we're not working together? Verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What we do on Sabbath morning matters. How we serve each other matters. What you are a part of for this church makes a difference for both the church and for others. Romans 12, verse 4, phrases it this way. Just as each one of you has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body. Each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Do you hear something that resonates with your heart in that list? A little different list now this time, isn't it? Something that the body is being asked to do, to build each other up, to work together. Just as your fingers work together, so we have to work together. 
Verse 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Joyful in hope. Has it been a hard year to be joyful? To be hopeful? Well, when we come together and we bring that atmosphere of joy in our singing and our worship together, there's a little bit of joy, a little bit of hope restored in our hearts, isn't there? This is God's call to a thriving community, isn't it? Different gifts. You've all been given different gifts. Some of you can do stuff that I can't do. You've all been given those gifts for this church body in Chowchilla to function, to work, to be a team, to be filled with energy, to be joyful, to be bold and courageous for God. And all of what we're doing this morning is a part of that where we reset our minds and we focus on God for a few hours and focus on His mission for us. So let's bring this home and answer the question again that we were talking about before. What is God asking you to do for your church? We had a list in Scripture, right? Evangelist, pastor, teacher. We had giving generously, encouraging, merciful, leadership. And I'm going to add to that list. Music ministry, teaching, preaching, Sabbath school, visitation, Bible studies, working for the school, maintaining the building and facility, etc. It all makes a difference. When you walk on campus and you see a fresh-looking lawn and buildings that are up to date and a playground that's in good shape, Isn't that a witness for God? The kids sure seem to enjoy it. They want to come and play and be here. That's kind of a big deal, isn't it? It all matters. Maybe you're looking for a more outward-focused ministry, such as literature evangelism, or volunteering, as some of you already are, and more of you maybe are willing, to bring students to the school every day. Well, you don't have to do it every day, but somebody is bringing them every day. Or maybe you want to be a part of the new laundry ministry that's still getting set up at the Cardi Center. Or maybe God is putting on your heart a ministry that the church leadership hasn't thought of yet. And that's a perfect time for God to put that on your heart. Because the nominating committee is meeting. And we're excited for our members to be passionate in ministry. Corinthians 1, 12, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 12 tells it this way. There are different kinds of gifts, but same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. God has blessed you so that your spiritual gifts will bless the common good of the church. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. Though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we are all given the one spirit to drink. If the spirit is calling you to do something for the body of Christ here in Chowchilla, please let the nominating committee know. If the spirit is calling for you to do a new service, praise the Lord. Let's get all about it. Many parts to this body in Chowchilla, but one group passionate about Jesus, serving God in the way he's called you and the way he's called me. Having a place where God can meet with all of us and anyone who comes to be a part of this wonderful family in Chowchilla. And we are a family, are we not? Different people, different personalities, probably different political beliefs, but none of that matters, does it? Because in here, for this church body, it's about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom beyond the United States of America. Looking to a kingdom above and beyond anything that happens on this earth. Let me switch gears for a second. This might be controversial, but we're going to try it anyways. Don't worry. 
This is absolutely a trick question. What does this represent? And remember, it's absolutely a trick question, so don't worry. This $20 bill in my hand, what do you think it represents beyond just the financial ramifications? What does this represent? A form of your means. Form of your means? What was that, you might? Trade. Trade. Yes. And I'm going to I'm going to go off of that you might. What did we trade for this money? What did I trade to to earn this money? Time, energy, maybe a little blood, especially in farming. <laughs> maybe some stress, some worry. All wrapped up in what it took me to earn this money, isn't it? You go to work, you give of your life, your energy, your blood, and your sweat your time, and you make money. And then with this money, you're able to buy all sorts of things. But what happens when you take this money and give it to God? Or we think, oh, it's just a $20 bill. Okay, you know, throw that in the plate. But what are you really giving God? You're giving God your time, your money, your energy, your lifeblood, that it, your stress, your worry that it took you to make that money, aren't you? You're giving a part of your life and of your time to God's ministry, to God's service. I told you it was a trick question. So when you give money to this church and it's used in God's ministry, it's more than just, oh, I threw a 20 into the plate or I paid my tithe and that's just the way we do it. No, we're telling God with that sacrifice, you're important. This time, this energy, this money that I that I earned matters, and I'm giving it to you, Father. I'm honoring you in my tithes and offerings. And Malachi 3 tells us that he will bless us when we honor him with our tithes and offerings. Let's talk about a story. Jesus is sitting in the temple, watching people put money in the offering plate. And apparently it was a, must have been prominently located, so you had a chance to really show how many 20s were going in the offering plate. We've intentionally avoided that in our church by putting it in the lobby where you can just put it anytime you want. But prominently located, and these people are coming and dropping money into the offering plate. And then this widow, and you know the story, right, from Matthew 12, she comes and she puts in two small coins. And the Bible says they're a fraction of a penny. Well, we don't have any coins smaller than a penny. In fact, they're thinking about getting rid of the penny. But let's assume that it was like a penny in our modern culture because pennies, do you even bother to pick up a penny if you see it's on the ground? Oh. (laughs) Amen. Oh, a lot of people are picking it up, so praise the Lord. Did you know it takes your government two cents to make a penny? Just throwing it out there. That's why they're thinking about getting rid of pennies. It costs them two cents to make a a one-cent coin. Okay? But anyway, she puts in tiny coins. The smallest coin we have is pennies. So she's let's assume she puts in two pennies. And Jesus turns to his disciples, and you know the story. What does he say? She gave more than all the rest because that's all she had to live on. That $20 bill I held up doesn't matter if you're putting in 20s or 100s or 1s or 5s. What you're giving of yourself is what matters. Some can afford to give more, but maybe it's not as much of their life energy and their time as it is of yours to give less. So to God, it's not about the amount that's on the paper or on the coins. It's about the commitment to share with the Lord. And that too is service to the Lord. Do you know what this church does with your offerings? We track it very carefully. And Will will sometimes show you, right? And you can see all the categories where your offerings go. They're not being wasted. They're being used in ministry. Over 50% of your offerings go to take care of our school, which ministers to our children and children from the community. And every day where our teachers let them meet Jesus, something they can't do in any other school, which is why we have it. 
where they can meet Jesus, the master teacher, where they can be trained and meet the Savior. And isn't that what this church is all about, meeting Jesus? Amen. Your money, which is representative of your time, is not wasted. It matters. I want to tell you another story. I was, I think I'm done now, but I was part of the NAD executive committee. And this last week we had meetings. And the president of the Guam Micronesia Mission, and if we had had more time to set up PowerPoint, I might have set it up for you. But you can hopefully Google it on your phones later. Guam Micronesia. It's a bunch of tiny islands out the middle of the Pacific. That looked like, you know, a good 10-foot wave would take most of them out. Uh, He gave a presentation because Guam Micronesia is part of the North American Division. It's a little mission. Uh, The U.S. has a strong presence in Guam, which is why it made a certain amount of sense for us to take them in under a wing. But they're desperately poor. And they're part of our division. And yet, this, this president, every time he gives a presentation, he has relentless optimism, relentless energy, and joy. No matter what, I'm sure he has all the same struggles that we have here in our churches here. And yet he's just, you can just feel the energy in this man. Driving energy about what God is doing in his territory in Guam and Micronesia. And they're spread out a long ways. They don't have much land mass, but vast amounts of ocean. I think Guam is over 3,000 miles from a little tiny island called Ebai. And I want to tell you about this one pastor he told us about. The pastor is is from the Philippines, and he must have been visiting family or went home. He's trying to get back to Ebai. Now, you have to understand, Ebai is 80 acres. The entire island is 80 acres. And so, I'm not sure, what is this, Duane? Is this a 20 that we're sitting on? 35. 35. And the one across the road is 64. So, so not even this, that's too much land. Where we're sitting here and then the 64, oh, that's too much. So we'd have to cut some of that off. If that helps you visualize what 80 acres is. Thank you, Duane. So, 80 acres. This is the island that he's serving on. 15,000 people living on 80 acres of land which is roughly the city of Chowchilla, although I think we include the prison in our 15,000. So we'd have to take them all out of the prison and cram us all into this 80-acre island, 15,000 people on an island that literally does not look more than 10 feet above sea level when I looked at it. And it's incredible. And they're just stacked in there and tight as as you can be. This is his territory. This is his call, his ministry for God. He's trying to get back to his family on Ebi. He lands in Guam in March. Can you guess what happens? COVID hits, and the Federated States of Micronesia, in order to restrain the spread of the virus, and they are one of the countries that doesn't have it, so it's been effective, I suppose shut their borders. Nobody out, nobody in. He's in Guam, which is where the headquarters of the Guam Micronesia Mission is. He got stuck in Guam in March. His wife and little child, and it hits home for me because I have a little child, she was, I don't know, less than a year, I think, when he left. He's still on Guam today as we speak. Over six months, or what is it, March to now? Is that eight months now? Eight months he's been separated from his wife and child. Stuck on Guam, can't get to Ebi, can't get back to his church because they shut the borders. Is that a little bit of tribulation? A little bit of challenge for that man? Yeah. But instead of sitting on Guam and sulking, He did sit on Guam for two or three weeks, hoping he could keep getting that flight. But finally, he realized bad stuff was happening. And so instead of just sitting on Guam, moping, pining away for his wife and children, 
he decides he's going to take the Voice of Prophecy Bible studies, all 26 of them, and translate them into Marshallese, which is the native language of Ebai and the Marshall Islands. He's translating them from English, which is his second language, because he's Filipino, so he speaks one of the Philippine languages. He's translating them from English, which is his second language, into Marshallese, which is his third language that he was learning to try and be a better pastor on Ebi. And as of the NAD meetings, I believe he had finished all 26 lessons, Bible study lessons. Now that's what I call turning lemons into lemonade. You familiar with that reference? When the world gives you lemons, you don't just sit there and chew on the sour lemons. You make lemonade. I must tell you, I was so moved by this this union, excuse me, this mission, and the work they're doing, that I feel motivated to act. And I'm hoping you will too. Let me tell you another little challenge they're facing. On these islands, they have Adventist schools spread throughout. And every year, student missionaries from Walla Walla, PUC, Southern, Southwestern, go to these islands and they teach at these schools. That's the only way these schools operate is by student missionaries. Tiffany was a student missionary in Ponape, which is the capital of Micronesia. But this year when COVID hit, these student missionaries were evacuated. In fact, many of the church's missionaries have been evacuated because otherwise they would have been stuck. So now you have schools throughout this mission territory of Guam that have no teachers or they have very few teachers. And they're trying to teach 300 kids with eight teachers And they're doing it in sessions in different parts of the day. Thankfully, they've come up with a way of sending some of the missionaries to Guam. Because you can still get to Guam, I guess, because it's a part of the United States territories. And they're going to virtually teach from Guam to to the students in these classrooms. But this whole school system, this whole mission, thrives on the support of the North American division, and us. And they're now cut off, largely, not so much from money, but from interactions, from student missionaries, from missionaries. So this morning, this is is still in the beginning stages. I still need to talk with the school and with the church board. But I would like us... And if the church board says no, that's okay too. But I would like us to adopt one of these schools. And I'm thinking Ponape since that's where Tiffany went. And I'm hoping that we will be able to raise $5,000 to help that school survive through COVID. Now, I'm hoping that this will be a good activity that our, our kids can dialogue with their kids and exchange stuff virtually. But if that doesn't happen, that's fine. And if, if, and if it's not the ministry for this church, that's fine too. Tiffany and I will see what we can do on our own. But this morning, I think it's crucial for us, not only with our ministry here, but to also be involved in a ministry around the world where we can do something joyful and that's full of hope, where we're just helping a school And another part of the world survive where our dollars can mean so much. And I know we need our money here locally too. And I'm not trying to take away from that. But if you're willing and if the church board is willing, you'll be hearing more from me as time moves on and as we try and raise money for this school. So stay tuned on that as I contact them and I contact you. So service to the Lord, energy, time, money. What does all this mean? It's all about the here and the now. It's all about saving people for Jesus. Because as the Bible tells us, we're looking for a country 
that we don't live in right now. This country, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. We're headed home. We're building the kingdom of heaven. And we want a lot of people there, don't we? We want everyone sitting in this room there too. Hebrews 12 phrased it this way. Therefore, and they're talking about everyone throughout history who has obeyed the call of Jesus Christ. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. See, it was hard then and it's hard today. But we can take joy in that. That we're right along with Paul and our brothers running the race for Christ. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Did you catch that? The story of your life, of how the Spirit is working in your life, is not written by you. If you'll let Jesus, he'll be the author. And perfecter, meaning he'll edit it too, won't he? He's going to author your story, how your life plays out. And he's going to edit it too, right? As he forgives our mistakes and he washes that out of your story. He washes it out of your story completely. He doesn't remember it. And if you need a text for that, in Kings he says, You have not obeyed me like my servant David who did only what was right in my eyes. The Bible records David's sins, and yet his story is washed clean by Jesus. Let's continue. Who for the joy set before him, Jesus, endured the cross, scorning at shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus tells us that if he was opposed, we will be opposed. If he had trouble, we will have trouble. But the Bible says us, take heart, I have overcome the world. We're looking for a great cloud of witnesses to go home with us. When Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, and we focus our eyes on what has truly mattered in our lives following Jesus, and we see him in the flesh for the real, glowing like the noonday sun in summer. That is where we're headed That is where our focus is. That is what we're serving. None of the challenges, none of the disappointments, the mountains that it takes for us to do our service will matter in that moment. Because you and me and our friends and our family will see Jesus. And forevermore will we live with him. So this morning, is your service to God in this church a waste of time? Is it mundane? No, it's vital. It's important. You're making a mural. You're painting a mosaic, tile by tile. You're making a picture for Christ, for people to see on this earth. So let us be strong and courageous in the Spirit. Let us be willing to serve God as he calls us as we move forward into the present and into the future. Let's pray. Father, we know that you've called us to service. And sometimes in our heart, we see the the challenges and the fears and the troubles, but you can wash all those away. You're the author of our story. You're the author of our service. Lord, we just need to be willing. Lord, make us willing. Make us willing to be used by you, to be filled with your Holy Spirit. May you place on each heart this morning in our church, whether on Zoom or in person, or not attending currently this morning, a desire to serve you and to follow Jesus wherever he goes. Lord, we need Jesus. We need to follow Jesus. And plant him like an oak in our hearts, that he will never be removed. By the power of your Spirit, may he move his people this morning and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, thank you this morning for being a part of our service. As the pastor says, go in peace. God bless.